Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship, where we love you enough to tell you the truth. On these programs, you will be able to follow our expository study of the authorized King James Version as we read verse by verse through books and occasionally tackle important topics for the purpose of helping Bible believers gain a thorough and accurate understanding of God's Word. We now invite you to join us in our study. This is not about putting on, it's about being. Didn't that sound deep? That was right off the cuff. I don't even have that in my notes. <laughs> That's just, <laughs> I had to say that because it really did sound kind of... But, uh, you know, it really is. That's what it's... You sum it up. We're supposed to be this, not just act it. I've known plenty of people who put on the show of love in front of other people especially, but behind closed doors and among the closest people in their lives, they didn't show this kind of love. I want to challenge you as we read this, this isn't talking about just you and your co-worker or your neighbor. This is talking about the very people you're surrounded by on a daily basis. That's where it should start. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, I want all of us to read verses 1 through 3 together. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. That's strong language uh, to uh, remind us that this is not about putting on a mask. And uh, we are in context studying this chapter in the midst of a discussion of the body and the gifts. So don't forget that. That he's saying that God gives gifts. God gives you the abilities and opportunities that you have to minister for Him. But it's important that it isn't just something you do. But it's important that you do this with the right motivation. The motivation being what our biblical word here is charity. Now it's important that we leave that in our text. The new versions have put the word love in there. There's a problem is words mean things. And today the word love does not mean what the Bible means. Today's definition of love is all about me. Today's definition of love is I'll leave this person I'm married to because I just don't love them anymore. What that means is they're not being satisfied right now. Uh, today's love is uh, more of a, a lust. I love you. Why? Because I want something from you. You see how that works? That's the worldly definition of love is serving self. You have something I want. Or I feel like I need. See all that person, I, self, all that. That's the opposite of the true biblical definition of love. And the biblical de definition is really this word charity. Of course, we think of goodwill <laughs> and the Salvation Army when we think of the word charity. But the word charity is a word, again, the old saying is true. Charity begins where? At home. At home. Charity begins around the people you live with on a daily basis. That's where charity begins. There are a lot of people who write big checks because they've made a lot of money. And they send that off to the charity of their choice, not only for the tax write-off, but because it soothes their conscience about the fact that they have betrayed and ignored those closest to them. There are plenty of men and women who have given the testimony that they made lots of money. They worked and worked and worked, and they lied, cheated, and stilled in some cases. And they neglected those around them, and all they left were charity, contributions, and their last will and testament. And that chunk of change they leave behind when they die is supposed to make up for all that. doesn't work like that. That's not true love. Works without love is hypocrisy. Works 
without love is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is a word that is where we actually get the idea of an actor. And an actor, when they are on stage, that guy playing Abe Lincoln in that movie isn't Abe Lincoln. That guy playing uh, George Washington, Jeff Daniels played George Washington in a movie. He did a really good job, but he still isn't George Washington. You see, and that's the picture, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with being an actor and playing out on stage, but that should only happen on stage. Sadly, it happens in the real world with people. And according to where they're at, they put on a certain mask and they play a part. That's hypocrisy. You hear a lot of people say, oh, church, full of hypocrites. <laughs> and uh, I like to say, well, we can always use one more. Come on. Because <laughs> all of us have to battle this thing of hypocrisy. And uh, our battle is just to not to allow this to become who we are. And we should not... Uh, do things for attention. Gifts, we talked about already. The spiritual gifts God gives you isn't to make you the focal point. It's to glorify Jesus Christ. And so if you are operating in love, then you're going to glorify Jesus Christ and you're going to benefit those around you. And that's the way you know that it's a true spiritual gift. That's the way you know when love is in operation. When true love is in operation... People are going to thank God for you, and they are going to benefit for having known you. Look at verse 4, and read that with me. Charity suffereth long, and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. There is the real definition of love. It is the opposite of what I just described. It is selfless. It is giving. Charity. <laughs> There's that word again. It is giving. He says, charity suffereth long. People say all the time, oh, I want to be more like Jesus. Well, then you better be long-suffering. Mm -hmm. Look at uh, the probably a passage a lot of you have on your mind already. Second Peter. Turn over to Second Peter real quick. Keep your finger on 1 Corinthians 13. We will come back to that. But Second Peter. Hebrews, James, First and Second Peter. And chapter 3, and people will ask, why is it taking so long for the Lord to return? It seems like it's his, the promise of His return it seems like it's been for 2,000 years. It just seems like He's taking so long. Well, we see why. In verse 9, 2 Peter 3, 9, read that with me. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You see, the reason the Lord has not come back yet is because He's long-suffering. He is giving more time and more time and more time. Those of us who are saved, we want Him to come back, and there's nothing wrong with that. We should love His appearing, the Bible says. It's a blessed hope. But at the same time, we understand God is being patient and long-suffering and giving people more time to return. And that's to be a picture that we follow in our lives. Um, some of the strangest things I've seen happen among Christians is how they, you know, come to church and you hear these messages we're teaching and preaching, but then as soon as they walk out the front door and something hits them, they show no long-suffering, no patience. They're ready to fly off the handle. And we can't be like that. That's not the attitude that Christ has. It's not God's attitude. It's the attitude we should have is patience and long-suffering. Of course, I'm not standing up here saying, I've arrived, I've got this under, you know, you can just watch me and you'll see how it's done. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that when I violate that, I'm wrong. <laughs> when I'm short when I'm not long-suffering, then I'm wrong. Now, at the same time, uh, that doesn't mean you're just a floor mat and you let people run over you.